Hello and welcome to New America. I'm Heather Hurlbert, Director of our New Models of Policy Change Initiative. And on behalf of all of our team here, I'd like to welcome you to today's event celebrating the Out in National Security 2020 Leadership List. Um, at New America, our mission statement talks both about renewing the promise of America and honestly confronting places where we are failing to live up to our promise. And in 2020, asking ourselves questions and um, working with and spotlighting the people who are trying to change places we've fallen short in the past is a, is a key part of that work. And so for that reason, we were delighted to partner with Out in National Security to host their second leadership list, which you'll hear more about in a moment. And this panel today, which highlights the work that my project, the New Models of Policy Change, um, does looking at how, what is the relationship between representation between putting more diverse people in an environment between getting more seats at the table, more voices heard, and actual policy outcomes. Um, and the folks that we have speaking today just could not be better positioned to share all of that with us as it relates to LGBTQIA plus people in the foreign policy and national security space. I'm especially excited to bring you uh, Luke Schlissner and Mira Patel, who are our host and moderator for the day. You can learn more about them um, in the Outlist. Uh, Mira is an honoree this year, and Luke is a co-founder and director of Out in National Security. They both have illustrious resumes in government and the private sector. Um, Luke in the White House and Defense Department. Mira at the State Department, uh, Facebook and Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, but um, a, a quality that they share and that is so central to uh, what this group and these honorees are doing. And frankly, one of the things that I think is holds the most promise and excitement for the future of US foreign policy. When I asked my boss, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who very much wanted to be here today, um, what what, if anything, she would have said, she uh, looked back to working with Mira at the State Department and said, you know, they're an example of what one very determined person can do. Um, the, just the scope of the work that she felt, Mira, you were able to accomplish at State. And that to me really says something about you, but also about what Luke and his colleagues have done without, and frankly, what all of the honorees have done. And I think it brings up both that you're extraordinary individuals, but you know that you're extraordinary individuals with a community behind you, and that's the phenomenon that we're going to talk about here for the next hour. So without any further ado, I am delighted to turn over to Luke Schlesner. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everyone. I'm Luke Schlesner. I'm the president and co-founder of Out in National Security, along with uh, Rusty Pickens, who many of you will know, and Sean Skelly, who many of you will know. Uh, we're a little bit over two years old at this point, and our organization has four key goals, you know, to promote, recruit, and retain LGBTQIA folks in national security, foreign policy, defense development, diplomacy, all that, uh, to change law, custom, and policy so that we are more welcome and included in this space, to connect all of the employee resource groups across that spectrum, and to do public education today touches on all four of those goals, and I could not be happier or prouder to be here with all of you and with Mira and our panelists. I'm gonna pass it over to Mira now to begin our panel. Thank you so much to you both. Well, we're here to celebrate, as Luke and Heather mentioned, the 2020 LGBTQIA Out National Security Leadership List, and to have a conversation around the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the national security and foreign policy enterprise. And in particular, getting the chance to learn from a, an expert panel who have worked on these issues, particularly LGBTI human rights for many years. And so I think that connection between what does it mean to be individuals operating in this space and what does it mean to be promulgating policies both at home and abroad that improve the conditions of our community and that uphold safety and security in the world is incredibly important. And so we're operating at a time when I think we're at a, a you know, about 60 days out from the election, a, a real crossroads. Um, 
so many of us are deeply familiar with the long history of discrimination within the national security arena from blue ticket discharges in the military to the lavender scare and the clearing out of um, of open or suspectedly gay uh, people uh, at the State Department. Um, limits on security clearances existed until the mid 90s when many of us were alive, but maybe not thinking yet about how to get a security clearance. And I think that context is really important because right now we have been um, and we're witnessing a, you know, two different paths for our country and for the President of the United States. Um, the transgender service ban impacts over 15,000 personnel in the US military right now. It's the largest employer, of course, in the United States. And I think that that's really why this, um, the urgency of this moment is so critical in terms of elevating LGBTQI practitioners of experts, um, not only because of the work that we're doing, but I really think it's important to think about the policy harms that have occurred in the past and to be able to prepare for a more equitable future by thinking about how we can set the frame for the next generation, for young people who might be watching this or who might not even think that a place like Washington DC is accessible for them and their talents, which we know it is. And so on this panel, we have Ryan Kaminsky, who's the Global Public Policy Lead for the World Benchmarking Alliance. Carrie Jo Ford Lynn, who's the director of the LGBTI Global Human Rights Initiative at the Estrella Lesbian Foundation for Justice. And Francisco Ben Cosme, who's the senior policy advisor at, at USF for Asia and Latin America. Personally, I'm really excited to hear about your lived experience, both in and around government, from the multilateral Ryan to advocating for and implementing human rights and international development assistance, um, Carrie Jo and Francisco, any role models you might have had as junior staffers and what your recommendations are for the future. So we'll dive in, we'll do some questions amongst us, and then we really want to hear from the crowd. We'd love your um, your thoughts, your questions for this expert group, and then we'll get into that discussion after this portion. So to start off, I, I would love each one of you to share a bit of your bio, uh, please brag, and um, also to be able to think through uh, something that's been on my mind as, as the summer wraps up. Um, the events of the summer to me, particularly around George Floyd's murder and the calls for racial justice, racial equity, um, have led to a lot of DC-based and national security and foreign affairs-based organizations, including the ones on this call, to call for racial justice and equity. It feels like it's an important moment for experts like you to be helping us chart that course um, in what feels like a new terrain. So I wanted to ask you about where you have seen the greatest benefits for increased diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and what the greatest dangers might be of the national security space being a largely monolithic community. As Susan Rice put it, right, white, male, and Yale. And then the second question is, what's one thing everyone gets wrong when they're talking about how to improve DNI? So let's start with uh, Carrie Jo, and we can go down the line. Thank you. Okay, starting with me. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Mira. Uh, as, as Mira mentioned, I am the director of the LGBTI Global Human Rights Initiative at Australia, and I come to this work, uh, you know, spanning 20 years uh, working from community-based foundations in Jamaica to now working with a U.S.-based uh, public foundation, uh, you know, working to uh, support LGBTI activists globally. Um, Australia has been funding uh, partners, you know, in over 100 countries. And uh, the work that I do currently is to manage uh, the USAID and Swedish and Canadian funded uh, global partnership. And so, you know, when you talk about lived experience, Mira, I think that, you know, coming from Jamaica and being with uh, and in community with many of our L LGBTI activists, it is a very particular time, not because these issues are new, but because we're having more dialogue about these issues. The, the awareness has increased, acknowledgements have, you know, increased uh, in general. Uh, around the systemic issues that uh, we face here in the US, but also across the world. And so it's been, it's been really, uh, it's been a really up, 
uprooting time uh, and appending time for especially communities of color. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, is, is of benefit when we have people of color, when we have people who live at the intersections of identities such as sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, is that you benefit from a greater perspective. And, uh, and when you have that benefit of greater perspective, you are able to uh, identify more creative solutions. Uh, I have found in my work uh, that the most impacted communities and persons are the ones who have, uh, who have access to their own solutions if we were only to listen. So that's one of the things, and I think to your second question, uh, before I pass it on to Ryan or Francisco, is the biggest mistake in DNI. DNI is just the beginning. Diversity and inclusion is just the beginning. Uh, we have to talk about equity. We have to talk about power. We have to talk about what partnership actually means. Um, it means authentically listening and taking those into account. It means that the work, uh, one of the things that we have seen in the private sector uh, public spaces is that uh, we are looking to people of color and uh, LGBTI people for the solutions. Um, and I just said we have them, but the actual work needs to be the people who hold the power. Um, they need to put something on the line. And there are so many ways that we can, we can hold accountability um, and move the needle on that. Terrific, there. thank you. Francisco? Thank you so much, Mira. And very much, um, you know, Terry Jo stole a lot of what I was gonna say, but she did it a lot better than I ever possibly could. So glad she did it. Um, as you sort of mentioned, my title is I'm a senior policy advisor at the Open Society Foundation, but sort of only begins to describe uh, sort of my journey to um, now, but I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, sort of half Dominican, half Ecuadorian, uh, born and raised first, um, by a single mother, consider myself first generation and queer. Um, and I moved to DC right after college like many could, um, but really struggled with uh, sort of the inequities that DC and kind of unpaid internship um, sort of really um, presents as challenges to many uh, people from immigrant communities. And so for a long time, for six months, I had to uh, live in the back room of an office um, because I didn't want to ask my mom, or nor could, could, they, could my mom uh, sort of afford for me to continue living in DC, even though I had a paid internship at a wonderful national security think tank, CNAS, it still wasn't enough to cover uh, sort of the, the like living in DC. So I would shower at the gym or go to receptions to make sure to have dinner. Um, but I knew that, you know, my, my, my mom and the rest of my family really wanted me to, to move back to uh, New York where I was originally from, um, but I knew I wanted a, a career in national security. Um, I, knew I, I knew I had to sort of find my way in, um, and as many mentors told me, um, once you have that first job, it'll be a lot easier. It was only until uh, uh, then Senator Menendez took over uh, for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, being the first Hispanic chairman of the, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that he really put an emphasis to diversifying um, the Senate staff, uh, particularly on foreign affairs. And so he wanted to make sure that when people called into the Foreign Affairs Committee, they had Spanish speakers on the other line. And so, I, you know, he sort of recruited Spanish speakers and I was one of the first people uh, to make sure that my resume uh, was, was in the pile that they considered. Um, and then sort of, as I sort of continued to, so I got my first job on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but I continued to climb through the ranks. Um, and something that actually I read in something of your bio or sort of your description of advice that you had for Mira about how to sort of use your identity um, in a way to lift up your community, but also not simply silo yourself, which I think was really important advice. And so one of the things that I did was in the first two months that I was there, I reached out to whoever had the diversity and inclusion portfolio at the State Department, and I told them that this issue is really um, passionate to me and also to the chairman, and I wanted to help them. Um, you know, right after that meeting, they were like, write a bill on it. Um, and so we did write a bill. Um, it's now into law. It's the State Department Authorization FY 2013 bill, and you'll notice in it has four parts that uh, talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, a year later, I was carrying the, the State Department oversight portfolio and sort of using that, I made sure that I wasn't simply um, typecasted as sort of a diversity and inclusion person. I also uh, worked on Asia policy, which is where my main regional focus um, is now. And so 
I sort of used um, my identity to sort of lift, you know, making sure that um, there was, um, you know, inclusion issues um, and equity issues within the State Department, a task that still, still has many uh, chapters left to be written. Um, but to getting to your second um, question about what is still missing from this larger conversation, very much agree that um, to carry Joy's point about how sort of these larger structural issues are oftentimes not discussed. Oftentimes we use diversity as sort of um, simply a shiny object to sidestep some of these more uncomfortable discussions. One of those uncomfortable discussions is that uh, when we talk about national security diversity, uh, we're asking many people to join the same um, types of agencies that have been used uh, against them, right? So when we talk about don't ask, don't tell, lavender scare, it's the same tools of the oppressor that we're asking people to then join and sort of be part of. But it doesn't mean it's not important. We need to be part of the, those conversations because otherwise, um, you know, the, the, the powerful decide what is a national security threat and oftentimes we're at the table, um, be, um, uh, which are deemed national security threats. And so that's why I think it's really important to have this conversation, um, but, but I'll leave it there. That's perfect. Yeah, I think one of the things about national security agencies, as we know, is they tend to be far more conservative in many different ways than a lot of the domestically leading agencies, and that has extended legally and otherwise culturally to um, to our community, and in particular repressing our community or excluding us from being considered as part of their action, but also being considered as part of the work. Uh, so I want to turn it over to our last panelist, Ryan, for response and also a, um, a braggadocious introduction, please, Ryan. <laughs> No well, I, well, I'm, I'm just so impressed by everyone. Um, I have to say I'm not sure if I'm on the right panel. So um, thank you very much for having me. And thank you um, so much to New America as well as um, out in national security. It's truly an honor to be with everyone today and um, also to learn um, a whole bunch. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm currently the Global Public Policy Lead at the World Benchmarking Alliance. Um, if you haven't heard of the World Benchmarking Alliance, that's okay because it's only two years old. And um, I think it has a kind of niche mission, but a very important mission, which is focusing on uh, measuring corporate progress on the sustainable development goals and um, making sure that we can accomplish the sustainable development goals on, by 2030. And so this is all about eliminating extreme poverty, ensuring everyone has access to healthcare and access to justice. Um, part of my job is uh, really focusing on international forums like the United Nations, like the World Bank and G7 and G20. And, um, you know, what's really part of all these conversations when you're talking about sustainability and you're talking about human rights is at its core um, making sure you don't leave anyone behind and making sure that no matter who you are no matter where you are regardless of who you are or who you love um, you're part of these efforts and that we recognize that um, the international community is really not going to get too far unless we recognize um, these basic precepts so um, previous to the World Benchmarking Alliance, I was at the United Nations Foundation. Um, this was really all about bringing different sectors together. Um, so, you know, kind of having unconventional alliances um, on issues and having the human rights portfolio in that role, um, you know, it became immediately appar apparent to me, and I think this has been um, stated really eloquently by the previous panelists already, is the importance of bringing different unexpected and um, kind of unconventional audiences and um, sectors together to accomplish goals and really to move the dial forward because we can't rely on a single sector anymore to get these things done. And uh, previous uh, to that experience, um, I had the pleasure of being uh, a Fulbright Fellow um, in um, Hong Kong. And I, what I really liked about that opportunity, and I'm, I'm still getting over the fact it was uh, 10 years ago, was um, you know having the opportunity to go to the mainland China to talk about um, being gay in the United States, um, talk about challenges, but also progress and, you know, really just have an open forum with uh, a bunch of very young people to talk about the questions they had to um, try and alleviate some misperceptions, but also talk about um, what we could all do to make sure we're treating everyone with um, dignity and respect. Um, Nira, to answer your um, questions, I think that you know, of course, one strength of when we get this right is when people go into organizations, whether it's in foreign policy or national security, it's recognizing that this is not only their right to be included, it's not only, um, you know, the baseline to be included, but also um, that their presence and their contributions are real strength and help uh, make things work better. Um, I really recommend Lee Badgett's new book um, about um, LGBT rights and um, the economic case for LGBTI rights. It really presents groundbreaking landscape analysis of 
how organizations that are LGBTI inclusive work better, um, they um, work stronger economically speaking, and there's just some really fascinating um, insights to that. And I also think, you know, these victories, I think, you know, the LGBTI community, that when we approach these issues in organizations, um, of course, uh, Luke mentioned affinity groups, but we also have to look at the uh, full range of um, possibilities as well and full range of ways to make impact. I remember we were um, organizing an event at the United Nations General Assembly and we were passing around a poster and, you know, we had the symbols for men and women you see, you know, on bathrooms everywhere with the dress and the guy who's, you know, not wearing a dress. And I said, you know, if we're really having an event about inclusion, shouldn't we try and make this, you know, the truly inclusive and, you know, have these symbols appear differently so we're not, you know, accidentally advocating for a gender binary, an, an event that's all about inclusion and non-discrimination. And so we ended up changing the sign and people that were walking through the UN General Assembly headquarters during the um, busy time during UN General Assembly were able to see that what inclusion really means that it's not just strictly that gender binary. It's also just like that rainbow crosswalk that the US mission to the UN had on the street in 2016. World leaders from around the world crossed that crosswalk and saw um, that rainbow and were able to see that LGBTI people deserve to be part of the conversation. And also we just see big achievements. Being at the UN when I first started at the UN Foundation, um, you know, this was still kind of an issue that um, you really couldn't talk about too openly. And um, it was, you know, kind of, you know, maybe an event here or there, but, you know, over the time and through the work of hundreds of CSOs from around the world, advocates of all different backgrounds, uh, working closely with government, working with the private sector, we were able to accomplish um, a really big achievement, which was the mandate for the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. And just to wrap up on, um, you know, two uh, things to be concerned about is one is if we don't have truly intersectional inclusion, and I think Carrie Joe made this point really well, um, we're going to end up making the same mistakes before and worse, we're not going to have um, data to understand what the challenges are. So, you know, of all the funding for LGBTI issues, a World Bank UNDP study found only 5% goes to um, data and research. So we really need, need to make sure we're um, having genuinely disaggregated data and having a full intersectional approach. And last risk is we need to make sure we're also using every toolbox, every tool in the foreign policy toolbox. Because if we're only looking at sanctions, which it seemed was very prominent during the presidential uh, debates, um, we're missing part of it. We're not consulting with civil society. We're not consulting with human rights defenders on the ground. So it's important we have the full scope of engagement. And we're also looking to learn from people on the ground and see what works in different contexts as well. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so one thing I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is around this concept of rising leaders. I, I think this list has categorized all of us um, fortuitously into that category, but I think we can all imagine, um, at least I do certainly, um, that there's just so much work to be done. I'm not sure that I necessarily view myself that way, but to a 22-year-old or 23-year-old, we really are people that are leading lives and having impact professionally that um, are incredibly, um, I think, important in the world for, um, for people who are just starting out on their careers and wanting to know how they can forge a similar journey. And so I was curious to, I'll open up to all of you, but I'll start, Ryan, with you. You know, when we're talking about strategic human capital and in business school, there's a lot of data around the importance of diversity inclusion in teams, uh, but also having leadership directly supporting that diversity inclusion equity approach. And one challenge that I've always found um, is that, you know, there really aren't role models with similar backgrounds to look up to. I mean, I, especially when I was younger, but I still do this now and I just finished Susan Rice's autobiography, which is why she's on my mind. You know, I constantly read biographies just to try and understand and map out what are the patterns here? Who, what organizations are people part of? Where do they publish? Where do they work? How does political appointments work? What are the think tanks? Because I don't come from the world of DC. I didn't grow up. I'm well connected within it. And so I think I'm constantly on a learning journey. Um, and at times I think don't fully appreciate how much I have learned in that process. And so I was curious for you all, you know, as a junior professional, who were your role models? And I think secondly, you know, what advice would you have for younger LGBTQIA um, folks who are interested in the foreign policy and national security space who are entering it now in this incredibly fraught time. So I'll start with Ryan and then um, Francisco, Carrie Jo, please feel free to, to leap in. Yeah, it's, it's a really uh, important question. And, you know, I have to say, um, you know, 
working in this space, um, there's a whole lot of, you know, ne like never before, there's never been, especially in the foreign policy world, there's never been more institutions, there's never been more think tanks, there's um, various different um, types of ways to engage via the private sector, via NGOs, governments, um, more hybrid organizations. So, you know, I have to say, you know, in, in my case, um, mentorship was really important for me to have those opportunities. And I have to say, you know, it really was people that were willing to um, have that conversation, have that cup of coffee, um, invite you into their space, talk about, you know, kind of the big emerging trends in the field and, um, you know, really um, be willing to have that conversation and follow up. So, you know, in the UN, um, this was um, people um, in the, um, several people from the uh, Human Rights Office that, you know, I could talk about my thoughts and they can tell me where I was right and usually where I was wrong um, and, you know, what needed to be um, adjusted and the ways to think about that. Um, folks in the State Department, um, you know, kind of coming in, you know, some of these spaces very wide. I'm thinking, you know, we're going to do these 20 things, but then kind of getting a little bit more understanding of um, what's happening there. And, you know, during COVID, I'll just say, um, you know, I've had a little bit more opportunity to, um, you know, bone up on some history and learn about, you know, some of our, um, you know, you know, real trailblazers in this space and um, learn a lot about um, how these, how a lot of these professionals dealt with um, adversity. So um, that's been very helpful to me, especially um, as we're in uh, this, you know, new normal um, we're all in, but I can say, you know, networks like this are extremely helpful and certainly, you know, when I was a you know, young professional weren't immediately present. So I think that anyone on this call is actually on the right track. And I'll just conclude by saying one advantage of this kind of, you know, Zoom life we're all living it now is it's so much easier just to, you know, chat someone in the chat box and say, hi, introduce yourself and say, you know, can we get, do a quick, um, you know, meeting afterwards. Um, you know, we were having an event at WBA and it was really kind of funny to see an ambassador, you know, we were had at the event from the UN was like chatting with individual participants in the chat box and just being totally candid. And I think beforehand, you know, that might have been a lot, a, lot, a little bit more of a challenge, but now we, it's somewhat, at least in some ways, a little bit easier to establish those connections. So um, my advice would be, you know, don't self disqualify yourself. Don't think that you're not good enough to reach out. Um, that's why we're here. We're all here to support each other. So if you are in some of these meetings, you know, please reach out, ask for someone's contact information and use this kind of, you know, kind of troubling, unfortunate period we're in to, to your advantage to build those connections and bridges. Great. Carrie Jo or Francisco, would you like to weigh in? I can go next. Thanks. Um, so when I was younger, uh, I grew up in Jamaica. There were no out, uh, you know, professionals that I could look up to. And there certainly, you know, wasn't a whole lot of information available online. The internet was relatively new. And I hope I'm not aging myself right now, but it was relatively new. And so, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, I, I can understand how, it's isolating to be in countries and spaces and communities where you don't have people as reference points for your own lived experience and your own inner world. And so um, interestingly, after university, uh, you know, many of the advocacy organizations that exist now in Jamaica are five years old. Um, and the oldest one is JFLAG and a friend of mine who uh, I went to university with, he became like the head of JFLAG. And I was just like, that is phenomenal. Like, you know, with all the persecution that comes with being out and, you know, he had to use a pseudonym you know, for, in order to live that double life. And I thought, wow, that is like phenomenal. And then when I was working with a private sector foundation, um, you know, in telecoms, we started a private sector led non -dis anti discrimination campaign that included um, sexual orientation, which, you know, at the time, it was unheard of. And it made me really reflect about the privilege that I held, you know, in the space that I was, you know, the socioeconomic space, you know, how I looked, you know, everything, the job that I had. And I thought I have to use my privilege for something. And I joined the board and, you know, and that and shortly thereafter joined Australia Lesbian Foundation. And it became one of those things where I was I became professionally gay. 
And that was, you know, a big step. And that wasn't that long ago. But that's to say that there aren't that many out uh, professionals uh, in the Caribbean that were reference points. And so being in the US and being in this space and seeing, you know, and meeting so many people who have their own experiences, the hearing Francisco's journey, you know, I find that to be amazing. And the fact that we have networks like this and lists like this is phenomenal uh, because we are able to, you know, pay it forward in a way that we really didn't have these resources when we were younger. And, and I find, you know, even an emphasis on diversity, you know, within national security, I, you know, hats off to um, ONS and New America for this. And so um, I, I really am grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to be that, um, something that I would have loved to have had when I was younger. And so if there was advice, it's, I think, you know, similar to what Ryan said, I, I believe your voice matters, whichever space you're in, um, you know, the spaces that you're in where you may have some privilege, use it. Um, I think, you know, when, when I did, when I joined this list, one of the things that I said was to stay curious. I was always curious also about my own self and, you know, my own limits. And I was also very curious about, you know, what were my own growing edges? How uncomfortable can I be because there are people who don't have the same privileges that I have and you know we're in a time with COVID with the uprisings of protests where we have to get comfortable with discomfort and you know I think it's important for us to do a whole lot of self-reflection and so you know one of the people that I look up to Audre Lorde you know she said uh self-care is an act of uh you know political warfare and it's one of the things to uh you know really examine yourself and i think that when you take care of yourself when you make choices that are right for you um that in and of itself is political warfare and this is what we need in these times um so that's what i would say i pass it on to you francisco thank you um you know, when I think about the phrase white, male, and pale, I realize that um, issues of LGBTIA plus are just not even included in those three um, explicitly, right? And it sort of speaks to the fact that when we oftentimes when we talk about diversity and inclusion, um, we oftentimes forget about, um, you know, sexual orientation. We talk about, um, you know, we forget about what really questioning um, you know, long-standing um, issues of how we oftentimes think about inclusion, and it points to the fact that there isn't a lot of data about how um, LGBTI um, personnel exist within many of these agencies. And so, I really think that gets at that visibility issue that many uh, have touched on. And that you mentioned, Mira, and why it's so important that this list exists, um, because I think for the first time, a 22-year-old, 23-year-old leaving college and is entering the field and sort of look at future role models. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know about myself, but certainly uh, all of you in this panel and in many others on the list, um, you know, certainly um, people they can look up to and read about their experiences and somewhat identify um, with themselves. Uh, in. And part of the reason I say that is because growing up and entering the field, I didn't have um, any um, you know, individuals who look like me that I could really consider uh, role models. Um, I had plenty of role models. I had plenty of white, um, you know, uh, cisgender um, males who sponsored me, who helped me get from point A to point B. Um, and, but it was really, um, you know, it was really the fact that, um, the, the fact that I wasn't sure how to sort of grapple with this multiple identity intersectional, intersectional way in which um, I was both a queer person, but also Hispanic, first generation, um, and all these otherisms that um, I had to deal with um, and how to navigate that um, through the next few days. So when I think about my role models, I didn't 
you know, I oftentimes think about who I spoke to when things got really tough, and it was my mother, right, um, who traveled when she was 16 um, by herself without her family, um, and how, you know, she didn't look back, but, you know, she really had to struggle with, um, you know, and raising me by herself, and um, I think to that, I look at that as, as somebody who overcame adversity, um, and oftentimes see that as my source of strength, um, even in professional settings, and but definitely in personal settings. Um, so I really, you know, I think part of the problem is that oftentimes uh, the LGBTI community does not look like, does not oftentimes emphasize that intersectional lens, does not um, emphasize POCs within the LGBTI community, does not emphasize trans POC, does not emphasize all the intersectional ways in which this community has its diversity even within it. And so even um, as a young uh, now security staff, I do not see myself within that. And I think part of the reason Luke keeps me around is to constantly remind him uh, to make sure it's intersectional, but not, not just uh, talk to talk, but also walk to walk. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's it's interesting to me that so many of us have worked on other um, corridors around foreign policy and have come back repeatedly to the LGBTQI space, whether uh, through a sort of DNI and equity lens or through a policy lens. Um, and I, I do think that. Um, that internal grounding of, you know, what do you say when you're the only one in the room, when you sort of are looking at movements that purport to be representative of us, but that may not be fully there yet. How do we include ourselves in that conversation and elevate based on the privilege we have to elevate the movement to be more powerful? Um, but it is hard. And I, I want to acknowledge that because I know so many people in this audience have in our serving our government um, in enlisted and roles otherwise. Um, in diplomacy and development. Uh, and when I was appointed at the State Department, I was the only out woman for years uh, in the Obama administration, right? Which was a groundbreaking um, uh, administration from my biased progressive perspective, but it, it also was groundbreaking because it really had the most diverse group of political appointees we've ever seen. And I think having been, had the fortune of being in at that time, you see the difference that, you know, people or, pers or personnel or policy, right? Those people specifically move the ball forward in so many agencies across the federal government uh, because we happen to also be the most expert at times. And I think um, that's something that has been meaningful, uh, but it is really exciting to be able to see this list come out every year and to be like, there's more and more of us each year. And I can't imagine in 10 years from now, what this room will look like, but I think it's incredibly heartening. I wanted to uh, talk a bit about since we're almost at, speaking of 10 years, the 10 year anniversary of the Obama administration's 2011 presidential memorandum on international LGBT rights, which I had the great fortune of, of working um, under Anne Marie and with her uh, to develop with the White House and uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, and at the time, it was, you know, a sort of ragtag team of honestly young, youngish political and civil servants, both ally and LGBT who are sort of running around at different agencies and just hoping to kind of move the ball forward to set a marker in the sand. And when we were very lucky to work for allies that understood both the strategy behind it and believed that it was in the interest of the United States. Uh, so I wanted to talk a bit about two sides of um, where I think we are now. Uh, one is, is, you know, what are we hearing from advocates in the field around what the opportunities and most pressing challenges are, and in this year notwithstanding? Um, and how can the U.S. better address these goals? And one idea, and, and Ryan, you mentioned this, and I know, Carrie Joe, you've done lots of thinking around it, um, as well as, you know, what is an LGBTI inclusive foreign policy? What does that look like? Uh, but I think it's incredibly important to start with that first question of, what do we hear from the people for whom we purport to be acting? What are we hearing from them? What do we, what do they need from us if they do need anything? Uh, and so I wanted to turn it over to all three of you to, to step in at any point of that. And then after this question, um, just want to let the audience know, please get ready with your questions. We'd really love to have a, a robust and, and rich discussion as we often have in these settings. So who would like to start? I'll start off. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Mira. Uh, it's a great question, and I, I love that we are uh, talking about what it is that our partners are experiencing. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has uh, exacerbated the disparities that uh, we knew existed before, both here and abroad. 
you know, we have seen the rise in conservatism, we have seen uh, the rise in nationalism that has impacted, you know, LGBTI asylum seekers, um, you know, or immigrants. Um, and we've seen othering, like, no other time before. It, it's, it's just kind of blatant. Um, and it was, it existed before, but again, it's just exacerbated and out in the open. We've also seen a lot of closing spaces for civil society to speak out, to act, to actually be effective in their programming. But in all of this, and especially during this time, there are also opportunities. You know, there are significant opportunities for us to take collaborative approaches to examine what exactly partnership actually means, um, especially when we're talking about equity and diversity and inclusion. What does partnership mean in the context of those things? Um, and what does expertise look like? You know, yeah, you mentioned like being a subject matter expert. Um, you know, when we talk about things like research, does that mean you have to have a degree? or just the lived experience in order to verify data, for example. Um, those are things that I think uh, are really the opportunities that we're faced with in terms of how we address some of the systemic issues that have existed from time immemorial to um, incorporate more diverse voices, to incorporate the voices of those most impacted. I think that when we think about innovation, you know, the provenance of innovation has always been the people who have lacked access, power, you know, resources. And so uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to rethink innovation and where it comes from. Um, and that can range from technology to policy. Um, and I think that in terms of, you know, how it is that uh, we can be better allies, how we can use our positions um, or our place in the world, you know, what we, what a lot of activists need, what a lot of organizations need, LGBTI communities, apart from funding, um, and it's not just money, it's also multi-annual and flexible funding, um, you know, those are key. It's not funding that's tied to conditionality, and I think, Francisco, you mentioned this earlier, or, or, or Ryan, in terms of, like, you know, there are different ways to be an ally, there are different ways to um, support. It's uh, public out, you you know, out, out speaking, you know, it's also about um, mainstreaming, inclusive, you know, uh, and equitable approaches to the way that we do development. Um, you know, we can do better. Uh, and it also includes like a, a examining the policies that we have that actually increase barriers um, and increase opportunities for discrimination. There are many of them. And, and it, it requires a, a re-examination of all of that. And so I think, you know, we start with listening to our partners. We start with actually valuing, you know, what they say as well and taking that and incorporating that into our programming to make it much more effective. Great. Francisco Ryan, I uh, would love to hear more from you on the LGBTI inclusive policy. Um, and then Francisco, I'm wondering if you might have suggestions in particular on one or two action steps the U.S. government should be taking based on uh, Carrie Joe's and, and your work um, funding and supporting activists in the field. I think in particular, if we see a change in administration, there could be a lot of opportunity, um, but we're also moving into a global world order that looks very different, as Carrie just said, than it was 10 years ago. So maybe we'll start with Ryan and then move to Francisco. Um, you know, on LGBT inclusive foreign policy, I would just add, um, you know, the importance of coherence, um, making sure that, you know, we're talking about the presidential memorandum. Um, this is something that always needs to be kept in mind. So, you know, you can't on the one hand be arguing for, um, you know, global decriminalization of same-sex relationships, but on the other hand, um, completely opposing um, any and all references to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, those two things um, don't go together. Um, you can't be, um, you know, doing kind of, you know, um, nice things with flags or, you know, propping up certain individuals um, at, you know, special events, but then on the other hand, um, banning a whole uh, segment of the population um, from the military. So I think that it's really important that this have strong policy coherence and um, you have, um, you know, 
different agencies, every single lever involved that's possible that can contribute to a narrative and uh, really um, upload um, recommendations and policies from the full spectrum of experience. You know, to Francisco's point, if you're trying to have an uh, LGBTI human rights policy and you don't have people who are speaking Spanish or who can engage people who speak Spanish who are human rights defenders, you know, you're probably in, you know, at a, a really big shortcoming there. So there needs to be not only policy coherence, but a way to make sure that all this is coming to one place. And so um, the really full um, you know, thrust of these actions can work together rather than kind of all disorganized and you know, perhaps um, you know, even um, undercutting um, each other in a, in a whole lot of ways. But you know, I will say on a positive note, you know, with a lot of the challenges that we've seen um, the last few years, you know, just a couple months ago, um, I think it was a couple months ago, you, know, you had 10,000 people rally at the Brooklyn Museum in New York for uh, Black Trans Lives, and it was absolutely incredible. I mean, the photos, it, I mean, the, the cameras couldn't get all the people at the event. It was so um, incredible to see that kind of pure activism. And um, of course, everyone was socially distinct, um, but it was just a really you know, m powerful m moment to see not only um, you know, the community coming together, but also, you know, breaking the silence and say more needs to be done and we're not going to shut up. We're going to keep calling for these reforms and calling for these changes. And I think that another part of foreign policy as well, and this will be my last point, is making sure that we're getting it right at home because you can't be making these statements abroad. You can't be, um, you know, trying to, you know, be an actor abroad and yet doing something completely hip hypocritical and having these massive gaps and problems back at home. It really, really hurts your cause. So really need to focus on um, having a um, domestic strategy as well. Very much agree with uh, what all the panelists said. Um, the only thing I'll say and add is that it's, it's not only about coherence, but it's also about um, using it and leveraging it um, as much as possible. And so what I mean by that is um, actually uh, Michelle Forno said it in a panel that New America had right before uh, a couple, I think it was last week, uh, where she said it's not, um, you know, strength doesn't come from the example of our power, but by the power of our example. And so um, it's really important that we, you know, that we make sure that uh, what we're preaching abroad is um, followed very much here at home. Um, when I was at Amnesty International and we were doing work on South Korean um, military LGBT issues, um, one of the ideas that we had strategized was connecting them with some of the people that had worked on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, and sort of building those linkages um, in sort of ways that was sort of couched under um, the US uh, Korean military alliance. Um, when I was um, at, you know, when, when we were working, Amnesty was one of the first organizations that really helped elevate uh, when Brunei was imposing its draconian law um, that would impact also LGBT issues and potentially give them a death penalty. And so, um, you know, how, how we communicated that in a way that wasn't Islamophobic um, and also cared about how we treat um, individuals of that religion here at home really mattered in terms of our messaging when it comes to, um, you know, that specific set of issues in Brunei and how it was received. Um, you know, I think unfortunately, um, if it's not, if the U.S. isn't putting this at the top of the agenda, then other donors will also withdraw with respect to um, civil society assistance support. Um, but I also, you know, to take care of point about you know making sure that we're not just providing civil society assistance support, but elevating that to human rights and also making sure it doesn't continue to be tied to um, certain met metrics that make it um, you know, unusable for many of these folks to be inside their region. And so I think it's, it's, it's making sure that we have a coordinator on LGBT issues that can really um, look at this issue strategically, making sure that we have, that, the, that has the support of the NSC so that it has um, support from the White House as well, um, and making sure that we're practicing those issues at home. So probably all the above. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and we'll turn it over to a Q&A momentarily. Just wanna remind folks, if you have questions to please put them into the chat. Uh, so right now we have one from Leon Ratz, uh, who thanked us for organizing the panel. Um, and one question that Leon gets uh, from early career folks who are interested in US government jobs within the national security space is whether you can be LGBT plus and get a security clearance. 
Um, and as many of us have talked about, there's a stigma associated with being LGBTQ in certain corners um, of the uh, foreign policy and national security establishment. And, you know, this list in particular, as Leon makes the great point, is a phenomenal way to showcase leaders that we have in our community. Uh, are there other ways we could think about, um, as Leon calls it, dismantling the stigma? Um, what, what should we be doing or thinking about or promoting as part of the toolkit as individuals or more broadly within the national security space to clarify what um, is possible now through rules, policies, regulation, personnel, and what we should be calling for at this moment, um, Francisco, because as you know, we are at um, a moment where there is a lot of promise potentially if there is a change in administration um, around this set of issues and who will be uh, supporting and promulgating the president's agenda on it. Does anyone want to take that up? I'm happy to, to take that first, uh, Kat. So this is security clearance issues is one of the things that we looked at um, when working with State Department authorization issues. It's one that not only impacts the LGBT uh, community, but also the API community has for a long time um, raised um, security clearance as a barrier to them working in very sensitive posts, for example, um, in China. And so, you know, I think one of the ideas, um, sort of one macro thing recommendation I would have is that whoever is putting, is, is in charge of security clearance operations, whether that's, and, and yes, we all know it's, it's, a, it's part of a larger bureaucracy, whether it's uh, the White House uh, Presidential Personnel Office, whether it's, um, you know, security clearances, depending on which agency is administered by different uh, set of folks. Um, so making sure that you have the personnel that is looking at this issue through an intersectional lens, will make, and making sure that it's a policy that LGBT is part, is part of that diversity, diverse and inclusive uh, personnel uh, sort of goals and agenda, I think can help make sure that there is cover for anybody who is looking at um, these sort of issues and sort of administering security clearances um, to make sure that it's, it's done in a way that is inclusive, that is equitable, and sort of remove some, and really try to remove um, some of the stigmatization as Leon mentioned. One of the other recommendations we had was creating an appeals process so that when an individual felt like they were wrongfully um, accused of uh, sort of, you know, their diversity being used against them, they could have a, a mechanism to uh, appeal that process. And one that is hopefully transparent for them, can hopefully look at their file and really adjudicate and sort of have a second set of eyes. And I really call for that appeals program that unfortunately died um, by the lawyers at the Department, is my understanding, um, as many things do. Um, but uh, hopefully it could be something that is uh, renewed and revived in the, in the future administration. Got it. Ryan, Carrie Jo, anything to add to that? Okay, excellent. Well, I had a question actually that, that Francisco, that prompted um, for me, which was in particular, I would love if, if you all might be uh, um, willing to to talk about an experience you've had coming out, whether personally or professionally, that was impactful, that you think about now, that sort of shapes how you approach the world. I bring this up because I remember coming out to Anne Marie, um, for example, and being very nervous about it. Again, I was literally the only out woman appointee at the, in the whole department. Um, and not that I anticipated a negative reaction for her, but I think there is that um, sort of exhilaration and terror uh, in personally coming out to people in your life, but professionally it's something quite different, uh, especially given the stigma and the cultures of conservative buttoned up foreign affairs, national security and development oriented um, uh, government roles in particular, because you are representing the American people. And traditionally that's, um, there's only been one uh, particular uh, or very limited ways to be able to do that that have been formally exclusive of our community. Um, so I was curious if, if anyone would like to share. And, and the reason I ask also is I think it's important um, to demystify how that works in coming out at work um, to help other people also begin to think through when and where they're able to do that safely, safely and appropriately. Let me know who wants to start. I always love coming out stories, so feel free to <laughs> add any color you want. 
I think I already shared my uh, professional coming out story um, when I had to change my LinkedIn profile to an organization that had a lesbian in it, um, you know, while still living in Jamaica. Uh, you know, I think that uh, regardless of where it is that we work, the organization that we work in, um, we we do a risk analysis. I think that's what happens when you're when 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 you are have an intersectional identity. You know whether you're uh, black, uh, you know a person of color, uh, gay, is that you have to assess the people in your circles to determine whether or not it's okay to be who you are, and that's just something that you know, apart from making you extremely astute at like observing human nature, you know, it, 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 it takes a toll. And I think for me, um, I had been out to most of my professional circles, um, you know, in, in, in small ways. And I think when we did launch that private sector led like anti-discrimination campaign, the question was asked of me because I was gay, you know, um, would you be the face of it? And that just like gave me pause because that's a very different thing. Being gay and working in, you know, in, in whether it's private sector or public foundation or, you know, with government, you know, that's one thing. And then being asked to be the face of it, which I think a lot of folks are being asked to be the face of things as part of DNI initiatives now, right? And it's just like, just because I am gay doesn't mean I'm the expert on being gay. You know, um, it doesn't mean that I should be the, the poster child, but it caused me to have my own personal kind of reflection and be like, I, 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 I can be out, I can be gay. And, you know, um, and it, it won't, that I can afford what it costs me. And I think it's just that risk assessment and, and figuring it out. And it's not, it's not a universal experience, you know, being able to do that. Um, as Francisco pointed out, there are ways in which uh, folks in, you know, various federal agencies experience discrimination, um, not getting promotions and having to file like, you know, cases. Um, against the agencies in order to really address that. And I think it's one of the things where we have non-discrimination policies in, in, in our agencies, but whether they're enforced or not, that is a, a different story. And I think that's part of the unfinished work, um, you know, to be done should we have a change in the administration. It's to make sure that the non-discrimination policies that exist are either expanded, strengthened, or consistently enforced. That's, again, find myself always agreeing with Carrie Jo. Um, that should be the mantra of this uh, event. But um, I, I had two coming out. So when I was uh, an intern, one of the first people I met was another POC uh, LGBT uh, person. And I got to know him for a, a couple of years. And then um, sort of, we became really good friends. And, I came out to him, but he was sort of the first person within my professional, professional network that um, I came out to. And I, you know, I don't know if it was because he was gay that I was really interested in getting to know him better, but it was certainly a, a peer mentor at the time. Um, and then the second one was a lot more public. Um, it was, um, you know, it was an LGBT issue in Asia that sort of come up. Um, and um, Out.com wanted to do a, a, a lipstickle about why this is only one of 20 other LGBT issues that they should care about. Um, and they asked me to do a write on it. And I said, you know, lipsticles are great, but let's, uh, what if I made it a little bit more personal and, and a little bit more educational and, and sort of use that as an opportunity to uh, sort of uh, publish being out, I guess, um, and use sort of my identity um, in the context of LGBT issues worldwide, but also here in the US and sort of how my reaction to uh, the, you know, sort of the um, anti-discriminatory, you know, sort of discriminatory law that was being imposed in that country. And so, you know, to be honest, a lot of my coworkers didn't know I was gay at that point or identified as queer. And um, to them, it was, it, they were just, I was lucky that I was working in a progressive place. Um, but again, that, um, you know, still issues of microaggression constantly happen, right? And so, I think that, um, you know, even though I've been fortunate to work 
in very inclusive environments. Um, you know, still there's just we wear so many different identities on our sleeve that um, you know issues of microaggression can so happen. And so, for example, um, it's not related to my queer identity, but you know, often I always get asked why, you know, how how come I didn't start working on Latin America issues, as if um, you know, being Hispanic means that I have to work on Latin America, and it just so happens now I do work on Latin America, but, but the last, uh, you know, seven years wasn't, uh, what wasn't that, and so, um, you know, and I'm sure, to carry George's point, that we don't always um, be, be make sure to break out, out of those silos um, simply based on your identity. I think it's important. And if it's, if it's okay, I'm going to borrow a story. Um, you know, in a previous um, work institution, um, I had a colleague um, who um, came out as uh, genderqueer. And, um, you know, this was an experience that ultimately turned out very positively. But I can say, you know, when it was initially happening, um, and, you know, a, a person walking into the UN wearing high heels, um, an environment where that usually you wouldn't see that, you know, type of thing, because it's a very conservative place, um, you know, I, from my perspective and looking back on it now, I remember seeing kind of the full range of reactions. Some people were nervous about how this could impact the organization. Other people genuinely wanted to learn more and hadn't had experience in this space and didn't know, know really what the concept of genderqueer was and identifying as genderqueer was and they wanted to learn more. You know, others, you know, kind of, you know, just kept quiet. Um, but I think, you know, and this, that, that was kind of the short term but I think overall, and you know, to this person's credit, um, they exhibited tremendous courage. They, you know, were very, you know, and just ter terrific in handling some questions from across our small office, and you know, just going full force and um, you know, at events and you know, being, who, you know, who they are and their authentic self. Um, you know, this was a time when you know I was really able to see you know, the full kind of spectrum of reactions. And following that, I think that the, the real benefit was you had just a tremendous education because a lot of people just didn't know and weren't aware of this. And, you know, it's easy to have a, you know, really kind of snap reaction and, and you know, that could be positive or negative, but I, there was just tremendous education, tragical, tremendous educational value. And I'm, you know, really happy to say this person um, documented their experiences um, with this, um, both at that office and then, um, you know, and other experiences. And it's a great book called um, Sissy, um, which is available at your local bookstore. But um, it um, really just was a learning experience for me and seeing that, you know, understanding, you know, how different colleagues can react and ways to, you know, make sure that you're not, you know, escalating a situation and making sure that, you know, there's a space, there's, when, you know, when someone does come out, there's a space for learning and there's a, a space for understanding, but also making sure that that person who's taking that step and courage and feels acknowledged and they, of course, feel like they fully belong in the organization and they can contribute just like any other colleague. So um, that was really, uh, I know I'll never forget it and I'm really happy, um, you know, they made the rainbow at the UN a little bit livelier. Thank you so much for sharing that story, Ryan. It's such a good reminder also that, you know, as each one of us continue to evolve personally, right, we have so much to learn from each other, um, so much to learn from young people who are constantly changing language and keeping us on the frontier um, and better reflective of um, who we are as individuals and our values. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. So we have a couple questions that have come in. So the first question is from Raphael. And uh, Raphael's world is in contracting and professional services. And Raphael founded a company that allows employees to truly be themselves, to be cared about, uh, to be authentic at work. And Raphael's question was about in the government space, you know, what is it like to, um, to think about LGBTQIA businesses. Um, and, uh, and Raphael, I'm assuming you might be talking about the sort of interplay between the private sector and the public sector. So at least as I've seen it, um, and assumptions get us in trouble, but I'll start there. As I've seen it, you know, I, having worked at the Small Business Administration, right now legally we don't have a way to designate certain businesses as being LGBTQIA owned in the same way we do for uh, as so-called minority-owned businesses. Um, what being a minority-owned business means is that you get, there are federal requirements by agency um, to contract a certain number of federal business, which is billions, trillions of dollars, 
with minority owned small businesses or minority owned businesses generally. Um, so that I think is incredibly important. Carrie Joy, I know you've done work on this in the, within the international development space. I think we've actually seen really interesting movement on how you think about non-discrimination and contractors that we use. So I'm wondering if you might share more there. And then of course, Ryan, um, Francisco, please feel free to jump in. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think there's also the NGLCC, which is the uh, National LGBT Chamber of Commerce that is also, you know, an organization that is essentially the business voice of the LGBT community. And uh, we worked with them under the partnership that Mira helped to forge, uh, the LGBTI Global Development Partnership, um, to really look at uh, creating a pipeline um, and a value chain for LGBT businesses globally, um, accessing, you know, uh, accessing contracts, accessing um, various services, uh, training, uh, leadership opportunities, workshops. Um, and so they were really very helpful to a lot of chambers. They established many across the world under this partnership with the US government. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, LGBTI businesses, I would say not necessarily the businesses, but, um, you know, Estrella works as an intermediary for uh, US government foreign assistance. And one of the things that we have been seeing is uh, it's been twofold. There's been increasing comfort with uh, US government funding, um, while at the same time, uh, increasing challenges. So uh, there's a way that uh, I think that it's a mixed bag at the moment. Um, and as Mira said, uh, there are not as many uh, designations and, and ways of, of charting the course um, and documenting. And I think Ryan mentioned that data collection is so very important that we have to find ways to be much more inclusive so that this analysis can be done, that we can be tracking um, to see where it is that improvement can be made. Great. And Ryan, you've had a lot of engagement with the corporate sector, and I was wondering if you could share a bit about how you've um, encountered their perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Sustainable Development Goals and LGBTI issues, um, which are included within the Sustainable Development Goals, but of course aren't their own pillar in and of themselves, um, but are part and parcel of many different human rights and uh, anti-discrimination issues. Uh, well, I wouldn't. I, I couldn't speak um, from W uh, World the World Benchmarking Alliances without uh, talking about benchmarks. In your personal so, capacity, oh. <laughs> <laughs> or or um, or just yeah, any thoughts you might have on that uh, the corporate space and oh, uh, absolutely that looks like as you see it based on uh, Rafael's question. Absolutely. Um, so you know, I, 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 again, I think in the last decade, you know, we've really seen um, a sea change with in, in this space with. Um, you know, a lot of the private sector going from, you know, something that perhaps is begrudgingly accepted to something that is affirmed and advanced and um, really, you know, kind of going on um, the offense. And of course, of course there, that's exception. There's, there's exceptions to that. That's not, you know, that's not the universal case. But, you know, one of the initiatives that was, you know, really terrific to um, engage at the UN was the Global LGBTI Standards of Conduct, Conduct, which is, you know, standards for equality in the workplace, the marketplace, and the community that, um, you know, they're going to be really mad. I don't know the exact number, but, you know, some 300 global uh, companies have signed on to, uh, to these standards following a global consultation process. And, you know, on the SDGs, um, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity isn't mentioned specifically, but it does also say um, leave no one behind. It does um, talk about the need to include everyone. And um, so we're seeing businesses, you know, um, you know, adopt these principles and align their practices. And we're doing a consultation now specifically on human rights, empowerment, and quality that align um, SDG targets to uh, business practices. But, you know, to get out of the, you know, kind of <laughs> nitty gritty of SDG targets, um, I will, will say just, just this, you know, I do think, you know, when civil society works with the private sector and making sure it's, of course, you know, responsible private sector company, not just any private sector company. But when you do have those sort of, you know, multi-stakeholder partnerships, you, I think, are more likely to succeed, and frankly, it's just a lot more fun. Um, you know, last year, not last, two years ago, um, you know, we did an event um, at the UN Foundation where we brought Kenneth Cole together with uh, UN diplomats from the Global North and South um, to the Broadway show um, 
to um, a, a Broadway show um, with L L LGBTI um, inclusion. And I'm, t I'm totally um, blanking on the name now. And I, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, but it was, it was just on Broadway. But, um, you know, it was really great opportunity for um, the business community to, oh, it was the prom, excuse me. Um, it was a great opportunity for um, the private sector to help raise awareness about LGBTI human rights and raise uh, money for a great UN campaign, but also for diplomats to see LGBTI people and really recognize that these challenges are universal, whether it's um, someplace abroad or a school in Indiana from the prom. Um, it really was a great opportunity and we really um, actually saw, um, you know, some really tangible and advocacy impact from, my, from that meeting and bringing these ambassadors together. So um, I do think it not only makes sense, it's not only the landscape is changing, but also um, it you know, really does help change the dial and that there's really a lot of entrepreneurial things when you're working on a cross-sector and multi-stakeholder basis. But of course, you need to make sure that the company's doing it for the right reasons, that they're themselves reflecting good practices, that they're not just trying to pink wash and you know, check a box, that they really are showing that they are a leader um, across their value and supply chain. Well, and speaking of Indiana, right, that's actually a great state where we have seen corporate intervention when Governor Pence attempted to implement an anti-LGBT law in the state. You had um, corporates saying they weren't going to hold conferences there, they were going to deviate their business in the state, um, and it resulted in that law not moving forward. Um, so I think that's, it was a fascinating domestic example to really see the private sector shift from just a sort of human resources perspective to really think about what does this mean both for our brand, but what does this mean for how we do our business in the sort of operational sense. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Okay, we have another question. Um, and Francisco, did you wanna weigh in on this before I move us quickly to another question? Just wave, okay, great. So we have a great question from Joe McLaughlin. Um, and uh, referencing uh, something we had talked about earlier. So, you know, that a lot of us have read bios to better understand and can gain commonalities um, where you can kind of dot the, dot the, draw a line between um, successful professionals and sort of what is the pattern, right? How can I better pattern match? Because if I can pattern match, I can figure out this town or I can figure out this agency. Um, and of course, the challenge is if we are not. Um, in those spaces, we're dealing with different sets of issues at times. Uh, so Joe talks about how national security is an incredibly challenging space to break into, um, and would love to hear from the panel on, uh, you know, what are some ways that LGBTQI um, students and young professionals can begin to gain this valuable knowledge, the insight, and the experience within the national security nexus in order to chart their own course successfully? And I'd love to hear from each one of the panelists on this, and then I'll offer some thoughts at the end. I can start off. Um, I mean, I think besides reading bios, what was really instrumental um, early on for me was just having a ton of informational interviews um, and learning each of those conversations for me, you know, which was at a very difficult moment where I thought, you know, I was, I was an intern for so long, it's not gonna work out. Every one of those informational interviews gave me a ray of hope that, okay, this person actually went about it maybe in a different way, or maybe this person, um, maybe this connection will lead down a path um, that otherwise might have not been open. And so, um, you know, I, I know that COVID has made that really difficult, but like Ryan said, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to people on the list, um, contact them um, via LinkedIn or Twitter, um, you know, I, I ideally find an area of commonality that you have, whether you went to the same school or simply are interested um, in something that they said in their sort of, um, you know, in front of their, uh, you know, comments uh, as they were honored. I think all of that can really help you make a, a connection and maybe learn about a different path that otherwise, um, for, otherwise you might have not thought uh, through. Not everyone goes through the same path. Everyone's path will be different, um, but I think it's really worth um, you know, sort of going through that discovery um, as you sort of navigate your own. So. Um, I'd agree with Francisco on a lot. I think reading bios was very, very helpful for me. Um, and especially the reaching out. Uh, I think now it's easy to reach out and ask someone to a virtual coffee. 
because we've gotten so much more used to um, the virtual world, Zoom calls, and it means that uh, people are, are more accessible in different ways um, because, you know, we're on a different platform. So it's not unheard of now to be connecting with someone in a different country or in a different state um, over coffee, which is not something that, uh, you know, we would have uh, thought to do maybe a year, two years ago, and technology enables us to do that. Um, so reaching out definitely. And yeah, I think those are those are really good. I'll piggyback on Francisco with that one. And I would just add super quickly that um, you know, really, if you see an opportunity, if you see um, you know a conference opportunity for a panel, you know, a job opportunity, um, you know, what have you, um, you know, a, kind of an initiative like this, a great initiative like this, an opportunity for to join a professional network. I think it's, you know, it's so easy, whether you're LGBTI or not, to see one, you know, kind of bullet, you know, in the description, and you're like, well, that's not quite me, so I, I can't apply for this, and then the whole thing gets shut down. And, um, you know, I think, you know, my perspective, you know, some of the times I've learned the most is when I didn't, the things didn't work out, and when I, you know, got an opportunity to look at my strengths, look at areas that I, you know, wasn't doing so well on, but I do think there, you know, is perhaps a tendency for many of us to see that one bullet or two bullets and say, well, that's not exactly my experience, so this totally isn't for me and I'll never get it. And um, I just think um, more than likely, um, you know, maybe this is the ideal candidate they're looking for, the absolute ideal person and that you still absolutely bring something to the table with the other parts of your background or your expertise and um, your kind of authentic experience that you're bringing to the table. So, you know, don't self-disqualify. If you see something that is kind of a bridge that would be a jump, you know, go for it. And, um, you know, there's every hope it will work, but, you know, don't, you know, tr try, and, try and get around that self-doubt. And it's not, it's easy to say that I know, but, um, you know, just really think about um, the strengths you, you actually bring to the table. Oh my gosh, Ryan, I really appreciate that. <laughs> that was great. And I think it, it also reminded me um, about going down rabbit holes. Like those are really, really great. So you start with a bio and then you end up, you know, at the Atlantic Council or the Truman National Security Project or, you know, some other fellowship program that is available only for people under the age of 30, you know, and those are wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, we might actually disqualify for those, but many of the young LGBT um, students and young leaders, they, it's the right time for them. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up, Carrie Jo. I was an Atlanta Council Millennium Fellow, and so one of the things I was going to mention was these fellowships that are targeting young people. That's what you go after. I will say, Ryan, I so appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, I think that it does get better, but imposter syndrome is real, and I experience it far too often. Uh, so I think apply for things you don't think you'll get and you'll be pleasantly surprised I think more often than not. Um, so I was going to say in addition to the fellowship, so the Atlanta Council Millennium Fellowship, Truman National Security Project, which is run by a terrific ally, Jenna Ben Yehuda, who spent time with uh, some of us at the State Department and worked very closely with me on LGBTI issues at State and is integrating a lot of that into Truman. Um, I would also think about, and this is a very DC answer, so take it with a grain of salt, but you know, People really are the work that's done in DC. One of the best things about it is you get to work with friends and especially if you work on the Hill um, or sort of on with younger research associate types of the think tanks, you're all very young and you love to go to happy hours together and all get to be friends and get to know each other and then you get to work together on things. So I would, um, it might be interesting for younger people, I think, to look at uh, both the Senate and the House have LGBT staffer groups that, that regularly, I mean, in normal times, but that I assume they're still kind of getting together for happy hours. That was something I really loved. I had worked on the Hill. And even after I left and went into the Obama administration, I would always go back. It was also helpful because, you know, as Francisco knows, then I knew the people who were on Senate Foreign Affairs or sorry, Senate Foreign Relations Committee or the House Foreign Affairs Committee um, to be able to work with them. So, for example, I got a bipartisan letter from the House Foreign Affairs Committee commending our international LGBT work. That only happened because I knew a young person who was LGBT who worked over there and then we plotted together to figure out how could we get both the bipartisan members on the record about this international LGBT issues and then how could we assuage the concerns of you know, the conservative uh, diplomatic bureaucracy that these issues were not something that was 
you know, fought too far afield and that was going to get the Hill upset at us because, you know, obviously the federal agencies are always very concerned about what the legislative branch thinks about the work that they're doing. Uh, so I think that piece is really helpful. The Equality Caucus represents all of the LGBT members. They often do events and gatherings as well. Um, and then at different think tanks, there are um, uh, Center for American Progress and the Human Rights Council and others do, um, do uh, gatherings. There's also um, the organization called Q Street, which is um, run by sort of a lobbyist, but it's really a, a group of policy advocates, private sector folks and others. And they have events um, that bring together a whole cross section of folks in DC who all work together. And I think it's a, that personal relationship is makes it a little bit easier in some ways than to be able to go up to someone senior that you've seen before, maybe you just watch their panel and be able to have more of an informal conversation uh, and then get to eventually have coffee with them one day, which I think is, is such a great honor. And I know each one of us has had that. Um, and those those kinds of focus times are really meaningful. Um, I wanted to, I don't think there are any more questions. So I'll just do one last call, call for um, from this crowd of uh, anything you'd love to hear from this panel on or just wanna make sure that we um, touch upon in our last few moments. And, um, Barring that, I wanted to bring us to a conclusion, um, mostly just to start with a deep amount of gratitude for New America and for Out in National Security for doing this work. Um, Luke, Sean, and Rusty, who are uh, Obama, uh, former Obama appointees, we call it LGBT44. Um, you know, when you're thinking about what more can I be doing in this space, what more can I do for the world, look at their example, look at what they've created. They've created an organization from scratch, they've created a leadership list, they have solicited promises from the future president of the United States around what um, equitable inclusion looks like in foreign policy. Um, and so I am finding this shared experience to be something that is um, incredibly helpful in a really challenging year. And I so appreciate the time that each one of the panelists took from their important jobs, advancing uh, social justice and rights for our community and many others around the world. Um, and I wanted to say that for each of you, for Luke, Sean, and Rusty, for all of you who serve in and around government, who are listening to this, your service to our country is so important. And it is not recognized often enough. Certainly it's not recognized monetarily. Uh, but I think in this moment when many Americans in particular have deep questions about what their government is doing, what the role of civic engagement could and should look like, um, you all have spent your lives dedicated to that. And I think that the more we can uplift the work that you're doing um, and the work that you will do in the future is, is something that gives me a deep amount of hope and excitement about what the next few months and, and the next few years will look like. Uh, so as Carrie Jo Apley said, this is just the beginning. Um, and I think we should both learn from history, but also I loved being able to think about how do we, do we get comfortable with discomfort? 2020 has represented a year of deep and personal discomfort to each and every one of us, personally, professionally, for so many reasons. Um, but there is real opportunity in thinking about um, what innovation actually looks like in practice. Innovation is discomfort inherent, right? It means that you're doing something different than everything that's been done before for better or worse. And so how can we learn lessons from that? And how can we all apply our privilege? All of us are here, are privileged enough to have an internet connection. We're privileged enough to know about this organization. We're privileged enough to have served. And that is a privilege. Uh, so one thought I, I would love to, to leave everyone with, and, and something that's been on my mind a lot, is a um, uh, a motto of the Black Suffragettes in the U.S. It's in the 100th year anniversary of, of the women's right to vote. Um, and their motto was, uh, lift while we climb. And I was curious to hear if, even if the panel has um, any, any, any thoughts just reacting to this. You know, what is one step that each one of us can take with every single person who's watching this panel, who's speaking and participating, to... Um, to lift while we climb. And whether that's from the power of our example to thinking about supporting this next generation of rising leaders who we learn so much from now, but who really need their voices in the arena as we're developing policies in order to make them more trenchant and more powerful and impactful. Um, for me personally, I'm gonna send this list, the application to next year's list to buy POC particularly women, trans, and gender nonconforming people. I'm telling you all now, so keep me honest. 
Um, it is truly, I think, the voices that are most lacking in this space and the ones I most want to hear from. And I didn't know if any of the panelists want to weigh in with just a quick thought on one step that you all might be taking or that you've already taken, uh, but wanted to, um, I'll pause there to see if anyone wants to leap in. I can go um, quickly. I have been taking virtual coffees with young LGBTI folks who have reached out to me on LinkedIn. So I've been doing that. But apart from that, I think in every space and on every platform that I'm in is something similar to you, Mira, which is to try to center the voices and the perspectives um, and priorities of the Black POC, you know, uh, GNC trans LGBTI partners that we have across the world, not just here, um, to 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 center the experience um, of our global south and global east um, sisters and brothers and nibblings. <laughs> yeah, no, would certainly agree with that. I was actually going to use a quote um, which very much echoes that. Um, many of you know uh, might might know this uh, former congressional candidate, Alexandria Chandler, who's also a Truman. Um, and she said, and I said this in the panel, where she said, um, if you pursue every policy with um, a trans, black, POC, um, immigrant lens, then you ensure that every policy is inclusive of everybody, uh, of the most marginalized, but also of everybody um, that it um, was meant to, uh, to, to be applied to. And so, I really think that um, more, you know, that, that quote to me really resonated and it sort of, um, you know, makes me think about everything that I do, um, not only um, in how can it benefit me, but also my community, but also other communities that I might not be part of, but um, oftentimes with that uh, most marginalized and intersection lens as well. Me, I'm gonna uh, listen and make sure that um, you know I'm learning from others and the experiences that they bring from the table, but also spotlight um, when we see these kind of best practices and we see um, various parts of the community doing extraordinary things to spotlight that success and make sure um, we can scale that and uh, make sure we can all continue um, to work together. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Heather, Luke, the terrific New America team who was wonderful in their preparation and execution of this event. And thank you to all uh, for joining and for your great questions and looking forward to seeing you next year. And in the interim, look forward to hearing about um, what you're doing for self-care, what you're doing to help lift while you rise and hopefully start 2020 um, uh, in full embrace of all the hope and opportunity we have ahead. So thank you very much.